together with my colleague and friend Juliana von Reppert Bismarck from Lie Detectors, we are hosting this special session this afternoon uh, on, as you know, the topic of the session this afternoon is diversification of support and funding for effective digital media literacy activities in Europe. So you're very welcome for joining us this afternoon. Please feel free to keep your camera on. It's nice to see some of the images and pictures from people and please keep your camera off for the, or your sorry your microphone off for the moment you're very welcome to use the chat during our session this afternoon to put questions points of view um, we are recording the session this afternoon and we will make the recording available afterwards and we will also make a list of resources available to everyone who takes part in our session this afternoon so um, as you can see, I'll just maybe run by the agenda for this afternoon to tell you what we will be covering. Um, myself and Juliana would like to first of all introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about the funding situation in our own organisations. And then we have two presentations and two inputs. First of all, from Nicholas Ayosa, Deputy Director, Head of Policy and Advocacy, Transparency International, and Rosden Kratkil Moore, Head of Digital Sphere, DW. Academy, the Sudeutsche Well Academy in Germany. So we're going to try and jointly moderate this, myself and Juliana. Juliana, good afternoon. Um, maybe we start mm -hmm. with lie detectors and then I can fill people in about our funding situation. Tell us a little bit about lie detectors. Sure. So hi, everybody. Thanks so much for diving in. And thank you very much um, to Sally for organizing this and agreeing to organize it jointly with us. Um, so um, as some of you might know, I am I am Juliana von Rappert Bismarck. I am the executive director and founder of a media literacy organization um, that is headquartered in Brussels and that is called Lie Detectors. Um, we are by now, um, I think um, it is fair to say, a leading um, journalist-led media literacy organization. Um, we are <clears throat> uh, working with journalists to strengthen resilience to, um, uh, you know, in the general citizenry to disinformation and polarization in Europe. And we do that very practically by training journalists um, and putting them into positions where they are training young and old, um, specifically in the education space, that's children, students, and teachers, so there might be some um, overlap with what some of you are doing. Um, we're quite large by now. We work with about 250 professional journalists um, with a, more than a thousand classrooms every year and several hundred teachers every year um, in several languages and several countries. Um, we also work with academia to evaluate what we do, um, the, the impact of that, and we work to inform various policy processes in various different kinds of expert um, groupings, sometimes with Sally. Um, and um, the, the policy processes that we, uh, ed, um, that we inform are largely in education and digital rights. And one of the reasons why we've been able to grow <clears throat> so quickly since we were funded, founded in 2017 is really because of this multi-year organizational grant that we have received from a foundation called the WIS Foundation. Um, and this organizational grant is really, as Nick will later on tell you, the, the non plus plus ultra and something that we're very lucky to have. Um, it helps us uh, plan the future and grow. Um, and it's also nice because being a nature conservation foundation, um, it is not tied to politics or commercial interest. Um, and in fact, one of our um, articles of association says that we will take that lie detectors takes no money from party political organizations or from the large internet platforms and this limits us to a great extent in what we can do and what kind of funding we can take and at the same time it has stood it is in good stead over the years um, simply because our target communities which are teachers children parents um, do put a high premium on um, on the on the independence from any real or perceived kind of um, influence or any kind of uh, um, thing that they might think uh, might be influencing what we do. So there we are. That's how we um, get our funding. Um, and um, I'm going to be very happy to co-moderate with Sally. But before we start co-moderating, I'll pass it back to Sally. Thank, 
Thanks, Juliana. Indeed. Um, so just in case people don't know a little bit about our funding. So the Media and Learning Association is a European not-for-profit association based here in Belgium. Um, we're set up about 12 years ago and we are essentially a membership organisation. So at the moment we have just over 70 members of the association who pay an annual membership fee for taking part in the being involved in the activities of the association. Um, we also receive funding through various different projects. Uh, to do specific pieces of work. So the main source of that funding up until now has been the European Commission through fundings that people will probably recognise like the Erasmus Plus programme and also through the Creative Europe programme. And we've also recently started a project funded under EMIF, the European Media Information Fund on teacher education. So very happy to answer any questions anyone might have about our funding models as well. And really this session came about because Julianne and I have been saying and talking to each other quite often in the last couple of months about why don't we talk more about funding and look at the different opportunities there are, but also some of the thinking behind this and how do you actually start to look at funding and look at opportunities and how you should do your planning and the strategies in place. So that's really why we decided to organize this session this afternoon. We hope you find it useful. We're dead keen to hear from you, your opinions and your ideas. So as I say, put comments into the chat um, or, you know, we can also switch on people's mics, of course, later on as well, if you'd like to put some questions. But to get the discussion going and to really um, sort of put some, some meat on the table, uh, we're really happy to have Nick kick off for us and take us through his thinking and tell us a little bit about where he's coming from when we start to talk about funding and planning and strategy. So, Nick, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to, to speak here today and, and for all the participants uh, for, for, for hopefully a lively discussion uh, after our interventions. Um, as said, uh, my name is Nick. I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Policy and Advocacy at the Transparency International EU Office. Uh, for those who don't know, Transparency International is the international movement against corruption. We have chapters all over the world. And of course, as a Brussels-based organization dealing with EU legislation um, and advocacy, uh, we work very closely with our 23 national chapters uh, in the union. Um, and what I'd like to discuss today, perhaps, is just some three main issues around sort of our funding model and the types of donors that we work with and the relationships we build with them, uh, but specifically from our own experience. Uh, I'm a civil society organization. Obviously, some lessons perhaps can be, be taken on board by you, but some might not be applicable. Um, and so uh, I think I'll just perhaps start um, by laying out, uh, at least from uh, our experience here in Brussels, some of the funding models uh, that we see uh, with ourselves, but also other civil society organizations, um, because they are diverse, uh, they are different depending on the organization, uh, and oftentimes in Brussels you're dealing with umbrella organizations, which also, you know, lends perhaps a different model than, than some perhaps national uh, context. Uh, so there are several models out there. I'll start with the ones that don't apply to us. Um, so uh, a lot of civil society organizations here in Brussels rely on annual contributions from uh, their headquarters or international secretariats. Um, it, uh, it often um, uh, is, is a different type or percentage of contribution depending on the organization. Um, a lot of organizations here in Brussels also de depend on membership fees from their, from their national chapters or members or organizations that they work with. Uh, but we don't have that model uh, at our office. Our office is um, project-based. Uh, so we rely on uh, a series of projects uh, that contribute to our advocacy activities uh, that align to our uh, global uh, strategy and our EU strategy. Uh, those projects take the form of, 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 of different models within the context of projects. I mean, of course, um, the, 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 the gold standard, the 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 absolute, uh, unfortunately for us, unattainable right now is is operational funding, which we don't presently have um, as much as we like. Uh, but the project base comes either in in very specific, uh, time limited uh, projects that have very defined uh, set of objectives and deliverables, or 
program funding, which are considered projects, but also perhaps a little bit more flexible. They're multi-annual in nature. Uh, they tend to, to talk about thematic themes um, that aren't as specific in nature and provide a bit more flexibility. Um, maybe now would be a good time to perhaps sort of go into uh, some of the thinking about and strategy behind, you know, which donors we approach, why do we approach some and not others, uh, and what type of grants, because uh, that's also another element that's rather important, do, do, we, do we seek out and which ones we don't. Um, I suppose I'll start with, the, with the, the funding model, the funding donors that we don't uh, don't approach. Uh, and as Juliana um, uh, has highlighted, we also don't accept um, uh, political uh, affiliated uh, donors. We're an apolitical organization. Uh, we work uh, on advocacy campaigns across uh, cross party uh, in nature in Brussels, and we don't want to be affiliated, obviously, with a particular uh, political party or, or, or foundation. Um, we also don't we don't um, also accept um, corporate sponsorship or donors. Uh, now, having said that, uh, we have in the past dabbled uh, with that model uh, with a corporate supporters forum where we would uh, provide a training on compliance, uh, different policy areas that could help improve the transparency or anti fraud frameworks when it comes to multinationals in Brussels. But we came to the determination many years ago that the the sheer Due diligence, due diligence involved in accepting that money and the potential reputational risks at play uh, just didn't make it worthwhile. So we, and again, as Transparency International, you can see all our funding uh, in specifics on our website, but we accept um, and seek out donors, both institutionally and private foundations, uh, but with different, with different aims. Um, so uh, we often receive money primarily from the uh, European Commission. We don't seek out uh, money from when it comes to the European Parliament because they are one of our primary advocacy targets. Uh, and the grants uh, that we apply for and have received in the past when it comes to the European Commission has to do with work that does not involve our advocacy related activities of the office. Uh, so we have uh, participated in calls that have dealt with research you know, to, to taking a look at, at, at different uh, comparative analysis uh, purely from a, a research perspective. Uh, we have been involved in grants that have uh, allowed for us to carry out capacity building activities when it comes to our national chapters uh, and, and uh, allow for the trading of, of skills and, 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 and different knowledge um, uh, based uh, activities. Uh, and then uh, on development, uh, we have uh, a technical component in our office that deals with an online platform that deals with political integrity issues called Integrity Watch, uh, where we also accept for development costs uh, contributions from different uh, EC grants. Uh, now, the private foundations uh, make up the large part of our advocacy campaign. Uh, so obviously, as an EU-centric, um, Brussels-based organization, our advocacy is on the EU institutions. And so that advocacy work is funded by private foundations. And it comes uh, from three main, but oftentimes different, depending on the size, uh, including Open Society Foundation, Secret Rousing Trust, uh, and a Dutch um, foundation called the Decium, uh, which has traditionally uh, funded us on our political integrity work. Um, and then uh, again, a conscious of the time and the need to 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 hopefully have a have a spirited discussion. I will just raise sort of how we have gone about uh, cultivating and building the relationships with with the donors um, in order to secure the the funding that we 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 presently have and, and have had. And I, I suppose the first lesson that we've learned, uh, having been doing this for quite some time, is the need to play the long game. Uh, in building relationships. Um, and this is particularly true uh, now, uh, post COVID, where foundations have been particularly um, selective in, in particularly in, in, in seeking out in, or, or receiving new donees. Uh, and so we put a lot of uh, research into um, prospective donors that we would like to approach uh, with, the, with the main goal of making sure that we kind of can identify where uh, there's strategic alignment between ourselves uh, and any potential donor. Uh, we at Transparency International are, are governed by our activities through a 10-year strategic um, uh, uh, strategy. Uh, globally, uh, we have refined that at an EU level. And so in the first point of call, we, we want to make sure that 
whatever foundation we're approaching has that strategic alignment. And then it's just a matter of building a relationship like you, you like you normally would perhaps with our with our advocacy in, in policymaking. You know, we 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 want to reach out. We want to have introductions. We want to inter introduce our work. Uh, we want to demonstrate what impact we've had in the space. Uh, that's some things that sometimes people forget. You you, you want to be able to demonstrate um, uh, the impact that you can bring to the table, and that oftentimes has corresponding communications elements in the office that you need to consider. You know, is the visibility of your office. Uh, correctly demonstrated either on websites or, or other publications that that you can you can bring to these initial conversations uh, and then of course it's just about building that up in sort of a tiered approach uh, on uh, presenting a concept uh, based again on that identified strategic alignment that will hopefully lead to further con conversations that will 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 turn into potential applications um, uh, and and potential funding. Oftentimes, you you have to to do also a tiered approach in the in the projects that might be awarded. Uh, sometimes it starts little with a small seed money, sort of to demonstrate you know whether you can both carry out the promised activities that you'd like to like to 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 to, to do, but also making sure that you have the operational capacity to manage uh, the funds. And that goes back to perhaps one of the other horizontal issues when we when we take a look um, at the donors is the type of grants that are on offer. Uh, we as a as a humble civil society organization of medium size in Brussels, we have we hover around 12 to 15 FTEs at any given time. We don't have the capacity to go for large grants. Um, we can we can be a, a project partner in them, uh, but obviously we don't actively seek out um, consortium as leads, coordinators of large projects. Uh, because depending on the type of funding, and this is particularly true with institutional funding, uh, you have to be, uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, have to be aware that uh, the management uh, and the operational capacity needed to, to, to engage in some of these grants can be quite significant. And so I have actually seen some NGOs get themselves in a bit of trouble uh, by entering into these grants, but not having the, with, with, with the requisite um, uh, advocacy or research capacity to carry out the deliverables, but not the corresponding operational capacity to manage the grant, uh, which can be sometimes bulky. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there because, uh, because I, I, I again I, I'm I'm aware of the fact that we have a, a lot of uh, participants here that hopefully can lead to a spirited discussion, and I'm happy to address any of the issues I raised or or any others that, questions that they may have uh, during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. That's really fascinating and um, and uh, sounds all sort of echoes and uh, I'm sure for the other organizations represented here as well. Does anybody have um, a question to start us off? I certainly have several, but maybe we want to start with those of you who've dialed in. If you want to put it into the chat, please do. Or if you want to raise your hand, please do. And, um, and then make sure that you identify yourself, tell us who you are and where you are and what your question is. And while you're thinking of your questions, perhaps I um, I may start. So first of all, um, I just wanted to say that what you were saying about um, operational funding and fostering relationships with funders really rung a bell with uh, with us because it really did take us approximately eight years to get to the, the place where we are now, this very, very um, lucky um, state of being so well funded. And we put an awful lot of work into it. I have a question about the... Um, political neutrality of your philanthropic funding at a time when everything is political, let's face it, um, even philanthropic funding can be seen as being political. Um, and I wonder how Transparency International EU steers against any perception that your work would be, quote, on a particular side of the political spectrum. What, what do you, what, how do you do that? Well, I think there's, yeah, no, this is an excellent question and certainly timely um, uh, for, for a number of reasons. <laughs> um, uh, so one is, is that, uh, yes, I mean, I work particularly in this town with, with politicians. And so there's always the, the risk of anything we do or any funding we get or any activity that we carry out that it could be politicized in nature. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, you know, you always have to be aware of, I'm critical, obviously, uh, sometimes of the, of the EU institutions. And, and over the years, we've also had to be very conscious of the fact that uh, those messages could be served for 
politicize Eurosceptic reasons, and they have. Um, and for the same reason why sometimes we are attacked by by our um, uh, our, our donors, um, a particularly open society, um, uh, because of course there is a there is a nasty anti Soros narrative coming primarily from the far right, and and obviously since we've taken on Borg campaigns that uh, have involved. Uh, Trying to 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 address the corruption deficiencies in Hungary, then we are susceptible to that. But I, I simply point out the fact that you know the activities that we do uh, aren't political in nature. Uh, we are trying to to ensure that the highest standards of anti-corruption and rule of law are in the member states. And to that end, we will work across the political spectrum. Um, and and we can demonstrate that we don't we don't hover in our activities around one political group, uh, not least because as as an advocacy organization uh, that I'd like to think is 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 professionalized, we need a majority uh, to ensure that any policy recommendations that we are we are pushing in, in in this in this in this town garners a majority. And to do that, you have to work across the spectrum. So uh, we we simply demonstrate that you know. The policy recommendations that we are advocating for are not political in nature, um, and the fact that we can demonstrate our actual advocacy work, no matter who's funding us, uh, works across party lines. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's one way, at least, that or two, several ways that we 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 mitigate that, but with the knowledge that you know anyone can politicize anything in this town, and they often do. Uh, I was criticized the other day uh, from, a, from, a, from a Hungarian Fetish member uh, in a hearing, so uh, mm -hmm. on NGOs generally. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that that perhaps is, mm -hmm. is, is, is the way we've addressed this over the years. Yeah, and I think that um, I wonder whether organizations and and, uh, and individuals dialed in today are also wondering um, how that applies within the media literacy space. Certainly when we work in classrooms, um, and with teachers, we have to be very, very careful and very sure that we are working in a way that is promoting media literacy without any kind of um, political um, overtones or convictions. Um, but um, Nick, while um, while we while we have you here, I want to also ask you a little bit about. You said something about the capacity to accept grants, um, and I think that in media literacy, I wonder whether people agree. Maybe you can put your thumbs up. We've we've seen a real evolution in. Um, the, the the funding space for media literacy, you know, from you know, certainly in the very few years that I've been doing this, and I'm sure that Sally has seen an even more dramatic change. Um, media literacy has gone from being very niche um, to really occupying the center stage in uh, you know in policy making as something that is really crucial for um, securing democracy in Europe and beyond. Um, and so sometimes there are uh, wonderful grants out there and wonderful possibilities. And my question is, what do you do? when you're working on some hot topic um, that all of a sudden everybody wants to jump on um, and all philanthropists and you know uh, all, all possible funders really want to get involved here what do you do when you get approached and you simply don't have the capacity and they have a let's say somebody approaches you and says we've got this grant coming up in the next year or you know for you know in the next couple of months and it's for next year and you do not have the capacity how do you keep an organization like that warm? How do you keep them engaged um, uh, when you can't actually do it at the time? Well, I mean, yeah, a very good question again, uh, and something that certainly has come up from time to time. Um, I mean, if, when I enter into these discussions, I, I suppose it, when you talk about capacity, as I alluded to in my previous remarks, you're talking about two sets of capacity: one, one operational capacity to manage whatever whatever grant that may be on the table, and and then of course, you know, the 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 actual capacity to carry out uh, whatever project activities you you would like to to see envisioned uh, under the grant. Um, and I tend to address this by being very frank and 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 honest. Uh, I I think that that has always carried more weight uh, with with donors. Uh, the, there's 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 always I suppose among some organizations who particularly again always have to fundraise. I mean because we're civil. I mean we're 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 never not fundraising. You know there's always you know taking a look at you know what what the prospects are of the of the the, the next six months or eighteen months. Um, uh, there there might be the 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 the. You know the 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 situation where you you might want to not be as upfront uh, with 
possibility of getting money later on, even though you don't have the capacity. So I tend to take an, a different approach and be completely upfront and honest. Here's what I can do. Here's the capacity I have. And if you want me to do this, this is what I would need to do it. This, because again, you're entering into discussion uh, about resources. So I, 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 tend to be very upfront and say, well, I, I think this is an excellent opportunity. I, I think that there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a window here to do X, Y, or Z as far as advocacy goes. Uh, we have this capacity that we can do that with for that sum of money. But if you want something more, um, and, and you can always sometimes make a compelling case for that, this is what we would need. Yeah, in, in very, very stark terms. And I know sometimes, you know, talking money makes people uncomfortable and, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to seem to think that, you know, to demonstrate that you don't have the, the capacity to do something if there's interest shown, because oftentimes, you know, it's very rare, actually, the donors will approach you. Um, so, I mean, if that happens, you know, you, you might feel compelled to, to, to perhaps not be as upfront on your capacity. So not to, 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 you know, it, risk losing that that money. But if you're up front, I, I tend to think that actually that's more appreciated by donors. I mean, of course, there's probably donors on this, this call that may disagree with me, but I, I'm frank, I'm honest, and I, I'm very clear on what I can and can't do uh, with the available capacity and resources, but what I can and can do if that's increased as well. Yep. Yes. Thank you, Nick. And we have a question from the audience. Nicoletta Corbu has posted something in the chat, but perhaps, Nicoletta, you would like to... Um, yeah, show your camera and ask um, oh, yes, uh, So <clears throat> I, I'm coming from academia. I'm a professor at the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration in Romania. And of course, my main interest in this webinar today is related to um, the possibility of finding uh, international grants that would build uh, bridges over a gap that I consider exist between the academia and organizations such as those that you represent. Uh, so first of all, the, the first part of the question was related to the possible um, funding sources via grants other than the classic Horizon Europe calls that we know. And one example that I have given is the media literacy for all preparatory action or if there are any other ways in which we can start working together outside this possible grants that, of course, you can always apply, but it's really difficult to, to win. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I certainly think there's always, there's always opportunities uh, in, in, in sort of forging a, a more collaborative, whether formal or informal relationship between NGOs and, and academics. And, and of course, we've participated in the, in the classics that you've mentioned. I mean, when we formally collaborate um, with academics, it's usually in, in some sort of Horizon 2020 or, or Horizon Europe uh, grant, because that's sort of institutionally when they when they when they do calls, that's sort of how they also envision the merging of these two stakeholders. Uh, but having said that, we have worked uh, over the years on many occasions uh, with academics, at least on an ad hoc basis, that has sometimes turned into uh, further calls once that relationship has been struck, uh, particularly around advocacy campaigns that have a uh, a legal dimension. Um, when it comes to directives or regulations. Oftentimes, uh, we rely on legal academics uh, when we're in pre-proposal phase, for instance, with the commission, uh, when they're discussing, well, should it be, you know, Article 114, internal market, or should we be creative with that legal base? That's oftentimes when we, we've relied on academics. And the other time we've relied on academics, at, at least not for us, but other organizations that have had funding. Actually, that's not true. In 2016, we did this. There was funding with academics. Um, and that was around, again, pre-proposal activities where academics would draft a, a draft directive that we would use as a, as a discussion with the commission as they're drafting their proposal. And we did that with the whistleblowing directive. Um, so there was a group of academics uh, who did a, did a study slash draft directive, and we did it again um, mm -hmm. in, a, in the case coalition, which again has a lot of different um, media freedom associations on SLAPs. And so uh, again, for, uh, for those who well, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows what, what slaps are, but they're the vexatious lawsuits that essentially target journalists, civil society, and whistleblowers to silence them um, uh, or self-censor 
themselves. Uh, and there's a there's a there's a legislative instrument that's been proposed now by the commission. And uh, so there's uh, lots of different uh, opportunities. But I, I suppose it, it's just uh, uh, about forging that initial relationship. Uh, so you know you know who's in the space because obviously legal academics are different than other academics who might be doing comparative studies on different frameworks in the member states. That, again, that can always be useful in terms of what we do, at least in Brussels, on advocacy because the policy recommendations and the advocacy that we carry out are always evidence-based, as they should be. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we rely, of course, on our international secretary in Berlin or other uh, international regional organizations for those standards like OECD, Greco, uh, but academics would would uh, obviously play a play a play an instrumental role in in building some of that evidence that we could use uh, on on the advocacy side of things. And I think it's just a matter of, yeah, just just being able to identify where those opportunities are, um, maybe past the formal the formal calls that we usually go to, um, like Horizon. Um, Nick, there's one more question before we move on, and we, we do want to hear from Roslyn, um, but there's one more question from Toby. Um, would you like to ask your question directly to the to this group? This is a question about who should be responsible for media literacy or advocate for it or advocate for its funding. Um, in fact, um, thank you, Chair. No, that, thank you, yeah. Chair. That's basically it. Um, the reason why I'm asking this question, uh, in South Africa, we are trying to develop a, a, a white paper on audio and audiovisual content services. And we have a chapter that deals with um, digital media literacy. And those are just some of the questions when we consult our stakeholders, wanting to find out from them, um, who do they think um, is best placed to deal with uh, digital media literacy, even though when you look at other jurisdictions, it's actually done by the regulator itself. However, there are, you know, um, debates around it. Thank you. Great, and I think that's a, that's actually a really interesting question and one that um, perhaps several of us can can pitch in on. Nick, do you want to start? And then I'm sure that um, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I'm I'm assuming that others could pitch in a a, a lot more. Uh, learned remarks on myself on this one. To be honest with you, I, I don't think I, I. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Juliana, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you can, you can field this one. Wonderful. So I'll, I'll maybe I'll start, and and Sally can can take it, take on, take it forward from there. But um, this is a really good question, and it's one that um, it's being discussed in Brussels very, very actively. Who's in charge of this? Whose responsibility is it? Who should be giving the funds, who should be making sure the funds are available. Um, and the conclusion, really, I think that we all probably agree is that it should be happening immediately. Whatever it is, it should be happening as quickly as possible. Um, in 2018, um, Jean-Claude Juncker, who at the time was the, uh, the president of the European Commission, um, put together an expert group um, on um, uh, disinformation uh, online and fake news. And one of the recommendations that came out was if we're going to be fighting disinformation, and this is a, a very particularly, um, you know, a, a timely issue in, in Brussels, certainly with elections coming up, um, through media literacy, then how is that media literacy going to be funded? And the answer that came up in the expert consensus of this expert group was that there ought to be funds coming in, not only from the European institutions, not only from the large internet platforms that have money, um, let's face it, and that don't currently face a tax or anything like that, and, and not only from um, philanthropy, but as a combination, and that the best way forward would be to create a clearinghouse mechanism, a single funding vehicle that would pool this money together. And by pooling this money, it would eradicate any real or perceived influence by any one of the donors. Um, and this seemed like a very elegant um, solution. It's actually much more difficult to put into practice. Um, but um, these are certainly things that... Um, that you know that, that that people are thinking about very actively also at OECD level there's an awful lot of um, movement at the moment at European Parliament level people are talking about the funding on this I can tell you that we have seen you know we're one of the very early beneficiaries of um, 
an organization that is a climate, con uh, a nature conservation foundation that made the link very quickly between um, uh, erosion of trust in facts, erosion of trust in science and threats to effective climate change policy. This is why a nature conservation foundation is funding a media literacy organization like Light Detectors, which isn't actually that obvious. Um, but I think you'll see that more and more, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, all the pro-democracy foundations and all the um, climate um, foundations, even you just read the news and you'll see whenever people are commenting on disinformation, they will be, and the need for media literacy, they will be addressing the fact. Um, and often they will be quoted from the point of view of, of, of climate activists, green politicians. So I would say that new sources of funding can certainly come from the philanthropic um, sector where, where the funds are usually being diverted to climate change and also to pro-democracy and democratic strengthening. So I, I see enormous potential there. And we have seen an awful lot of um, foundations and philanthropic um, organizations really shifting their attention. They might not be as visible. They might not be as familiar to you. They might not be as proactive because they might be quite new to this space, but they can be extremely receptive to and responsive to um, pitches from the kind of organizations like you doing the kind of organizations that you and we all are doing. That's, you know, that's the view from lie detectors, the experience from lie detectors, but I'm sure that Sally has got an even broader experience because of many more years in this space. No, I think I could just simply reflect what you're saying in so far as it, this calls for joined up thinking, this calls for an awful lot of collaboration, this calls for us looking at something in a much more holistic way than we probably have been doing in the past. And I think in a way that's what we see when we see the kinds of people who are joined up this afternoon, small, tiny NGOs trying to do their best in limited circumstances. And I think this is too big a challenge to leave it at that. So we just agree, Natombi, I think completely in terms of it being something that is much broader than we've probably been looking at in the past. I'm going to move on, if that's okay, uh, Juliana and Nick, and I'm going to introduce our second speaker this afternoon, and I'm delighted to welcome Rosalind, Rosalind uh, Kratochil, more head of the digital sphere from Deutsche Welle Academy, to give us another perspective on this whole question of diversification of funding for media literacy activities. Rosalind. Can you see my screen? We do in preview. Is it going? Uh, very small. And, yes, hit that. Then we're good. Or not. Mm, no, oh, yeah. Not. Okay. <laughs> we're good. So, go. yep. Thank you, Sally. I know I have a really difficult middle uh, surname. I blame my husband, it's Czech. Uh, <laughs> so I have difficulties myself with Kratochvo. But anyway, um, I work for DW Academy, as you said, Sally, and I am I'm really delighted to be here today to kind of uh, give you a little uh, insight into how we work and, um, and what we do. And so, as it says here, we're for free media, free expression, free society. And uh, DW Academy is the media development and journalism training wing of Deutsche Welle. And Deutsche Welle is the international public broadcaster for Germany, in case you don't know who we are. And so we're part of the, the public broadcaster. And we are um, very much focused on free and transparent media systems worldwide and on improving the political and legal framework for media um, overall. And so I just want to show you a quick map of, of where we work. So we work in over 63 countries and we work in five um, fields of action, strategic areas. And so one of those is media and information literacy, and the others are media and journalism education, digital rights, innovation for dialogue, and media viability. And the topic that I've known Sally for years now on has been media and information literacy, and I've been in this, um, in this field at Deutsche Welle Academy since 2017, working on MIL before I um, took over this new role as head of the digital sphere. And um, for us, it's, um, it's extremely important that we're transparent about where we get our money from too, as uh, Sally and Juliana and has, have been. And so we basically fundamentally have public funds. 
So we are funded by public and generally it's the German public funds. So we, our biggest funder is the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the BMZ. And we get there, they have a pot for media development and we get that money. And um, on top of that, that's our core funding that we get. And that's um, a long-term funding commitment that we have from the German government for media um, development. We get regional funding, multi-year funding of three-year cycles from the BMZ for each of the regions we work in. Um, and from the general, from the German Federal Foreign Office, that's the AA, we get what tends to be annual funding from them. So one-year funding. Again, it's part of a bigger grant that we that DW gets, so we get a component of it, but it's on a, an annual running basis. And then, as, um, as we kind of talked about, there's the EU, and we get quite a lot of multi-year funding from DJ INTPA, so like the international development um, money. At the moment, for MIL in Europe, we're currently, all of our projects are funded by the BMZ or the AA, but we've just got funding for MIL in Ukraine. In Europe, we're working in the Baltics and in the Balkans, Western Balkans generally. So we're looking at kind of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia in the Baltics. And then in the Western Balkans, it's Serbia is our main country focus. And then we have regional projects in Northern Macedonia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Albania. And then we also have projects in uh, Moldova and Ukraine. And so this is just kind of giving you a bit, little bit of the background and maybe it's fair to say just picking up um, on what was said with the EU we tend to also be a consortium lead like we have the capacity to do that uh, the administrative capacity <laughs> to, to, to do that and so this is how we work so we don't see ourselves as a donor we kind of see ourselves in the middle here so we have our donors if you very basic uh, diagram that i have for you <laughs> but, but we have we see ourselves as um as the small triangle within deutsche Welle. we get our money directly so mainly um from the bmz straight to us and then there's two different kinds of contracts that you that we give out and so we give out contracts that are service provider contracts. And that's where we decide what we want to do, what intervention we want to make. We decide on the goals, we decide on the outputs, the objectives. We do a tender and then people can apply to do, that, to do it. And um, these tenders tend to go through the Deutsche Vergabe portal for anybody that knows what that is, <laughs> but it has to, all tenders in Germany have to go through this portal. And then we also share them in our networks and share them like you'll see them also on social media on LinkedIn and things like that. You will see these calls for tenders. Now, the other way that we work is that we work in core partnership with an organization, a local organization. So in the country that we're working in, we will. Um, have this combination of service providers and core partners and with the core partners we decide on the goals together so we decide together what's the implementation strategy what are we trying to achieve what we're we trying to do and we do it together and then we would um, give funding to the core partner and then they can also engage service providers as you can see and then they're reaching the intermediaries to work with them to reach the final beneficiaries so for example in Moldo moldova you know we work with um with the teacher training institute who are then training the teachers and teachers reach the children and so this is the kind of um, logic behind it and we would maybe then work with service providers to give, make sure that our mill training materials are incorporated into this curriculum that the quality is of a level with mill experts from the region academia like we just heard from the romanian um input that we also would have studies done to understand what exactly is going on and this would all happen through tenders and service providers and then we have networking partners as well which is normally with memorandums of understanding so this is not where money is um, exchanged but normally with knowledge um, and we work very closely and this is another space where you get to know people who you could potentially work with in the future um, in consortia formed and then 
um, to give you a little bit of the strategy chart of how we work. So the strat this, this kind of grey box is where we're working um, in cooperation with um, local partners. And for us, um, what's really important and where we're different, we're where we're not a farm funder and it becomes very clear is we always work together and we're looking beyond the activity. So when we work with a partner in a country, we have common goals, we set them together, but we also look to how can we build the capacity of the organization, the partner. And so it goes beyond the, the deliverables of the project. And these, um, just to put it into um, context from Juliana, these kind of, um, projects are three years long when you start having and then they normally go on for another cycle so this is tends to be what we see depending on what we identify as the needs in the country and so just to kind of end I want to talk about how do we actually what's our criteria how do we go about this so we normally start an intervention in a country because the BMZ the German government has asked us to so it is political in a sense, yeah? We are driven by the, by the German politics. So when the German government decides they want to be active in a country, they will approach us and say, please go and do uh, um, exploratory mission and see what are the, what's the media ecosystem there? What are the needs? Where's the, what's required? And as we do that, we will interview lots of people. We'll speak to lots of people and we will work out what is the best need for us in this space like where is our gaps that we have the expertise to be a part of and what and then the other side is if we're already in a country and we've been working there every three years we have this new strategy development process and we look again at the country analysis we do again a deep dive into what's happening in the media landscape in the country where is the best use for us and from this we look at kind of identifying partners if we keep our current partners or if changes have happened and we have to move um, then we'll have to look for new partners and we have a criteria there so who can be our partner and we have three um, criteria so we have to have shared values shared interests and the organi organizational capacity to implement and these are the three criteria that we we base it on and then we just we determine this through lots of ways. So the first way is discussions with the potential partners. We talk a lot, <laughs> we get to know each other, we get to understand if it fits. We have a partner assessment process. We also look to references. And we also, if, we're, if we want, we will start with this um, kind of service provider contract and see if they have the capacity. If there's something where you think maybe it's going to, not going to work or it's going to be too difficult, then we have this option to start with. Because once we go down the partner route, it is very much about having common goals, common implementation, common agenda, and common, and also we both have a responsibility for the project. The responsibility lies with both of us. And um, yeah, so we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't see ourselves as, as donors as much as partners. And maybe that's enough for now. Thank you very much, Roslyn get that off to a start. That's great. Um, Glika has a question. Well, it kind of was partially answered by you as well, but maybe Glika, can you switch on your mic and uh, put this, put your question, put your point to, uh, you asked me to read my questions as an invitation request for follow-up for Rosalind, but maybe you'd like to ask that yourself. Glika? Uh, I will try. I hope that you can hear me because yep, it's a new, a, new, a new set, audio and video. Thank you so much, first of all, for this uh, webinar, so timely, and also for a really interesting uh, presentation, introduction to Deutsche Welle Academia from uh, Rosalind. Uh, we have uh, uh, an affiliate in Bulgaria uh, of Deutsche Welle as media, and probably you are, oh, most of you, <laughs> well known with all the issues that we have that are so connected. I, I like the title of your presentation. I put media literacy in, in our organization that is a network organization. We work uh, with this uh, framework of media freedom, media pluralism and media literacy so connected. And we have problems both in media freedom, uh, transparency of media ownership and media literacy. So my question initially was, but you've answered, how we could uh, express and who will make the first step to express interest uh, and probably to uh, to assist in identifying why a specific country, why a specific organization could be a good fit 
for partnership. Uh, because uh, as you mentioned, some of the partners, it's like a gap in the map uh, for Bulgaria. And this is uh, true for, I, I think, many of the opportunities that were mentioned. Um, and at the same time, we have similar problems uh, as Nick uh, already, uh, uh, already uh, emphasized at the beginning, because we are going closer to Hungary with this, the way that NGOs are represented uh, when we talk about foreign funding, specifically from American organizations. Thank you. Roslyn. I mean, oh yeah, I'm <laughs> not muted. <laughs> um, it's, for us, it's very, I mean, the countries we work in are pretty set by the German government. So the BMZ comes to us and says, um, these are the focus countries that they have for their development work. And that's how then we have the mandate, so to say, to then go and do this kind of um, needs assessment. It's unusual, I can't say it's, don't say it's not possible for us to go to the BMZ and say, we need to work in this country. Um, and, but then yes, we would um, have to have, a lot of reasons and what we tend to do and this is what we've done in the western balkans is we've kind of reached out from a country we're allowed to work in <laughs> into regional projects mm. and so um and so where we have the, the you know the focus country and we have the core funding is for Serbia, but with for out of Serbia we can stretch out and do regional projects and for Bulgaria it's tricky because we're not really near anywhere in, I mean, <laughs> in the region because we don't work in Hungary either. Close, we're in Moldova yeah. and Georgia um, in terms of um, our uh, media literacy work also. But, well, but this is, but nothing stops you from applying for tenders and for regional tenders as a, you know, like, um, but this is, this is one of our limitations, definitely. Where, where would you suggest people find that information in the first place? Because it must be quite difficult in many countries to actually just even get to know about opportunities like that. I mean, is it the German embassy in countries that can help with regard to Deutsche Welle? Or what's the best place? I mean, the German think? embassy is good to, to approach anyway for funding. Yeah. Um, the Foreign Office has, um, country strategies has funds on, in Bulgaria. And it's quite likely that you can get funding for media literacy from this kind of yeah. networking. Um, from this is a kind of, from a piece a, of advice we'd give generally, I think. Isn't I'd it? give Check that advice embassy. generally. Yes, yeah. it yeah. it's, it's, it's works all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not just the German embassy, let me be frank. <laughs> yeah. um, oh. But the, the other thing I wanted to say was um, for us, see this, I mean, it's very German, but this Deutsche Vergabe portal, which I can hardly even pronounce myself, is where the GIZ, all German entities have to ha have to put all of their tenders in there. So the GIZ have all of their tenders in there as well. So, and they quite often do things that touch on media literacy. So it's a place to worth having on your radar if you're looking for tenders. Yep. Juliana? Yes, I just wanted to add something to that. And I agree completely with Roslyn. It's a lot about being imaginative and creative, right? I mean, in Brussels, the European, um, I'm sorry, the US mission to the EU does an awful lot of funding of um, of these kind of projects, you know, and there's a reason, you know, there's an obvious reason why they would be doing, you know, it's a, it's a charm offensive, a lot of um, uh, embassies and missions are really quite active on, you know, let's call it a charm offensive and if you can if you can make it palatable to them they do have money for that um i also think that again the climate uh conservation space is really fertile ground to be looking at these sort of things um in the united states i can also tell you that the state department is becoming a lot more active the state department is funding a lot of librarian um organizations at the moment which is a very peculiar combination if you think about it but in these days it makes absolute sense because there is the security concern you know if you think about media literacy as really being something that many people are concerned about the security dimension the classic democratic dimension the climate skepticism dimension the 
uh, vaccine skepticism dimension. You know, you could probably even start approaching, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, um, the foundations that are linked to pharmaceuticals, for instance. They would probably be a lot more interested in this space um, than they were a few years ago. And I'm sure the list goes on, but these are just a few things that um, that come to mind. Yeah. Juliana, we're going to we're going to open the floor in a moment and just get Nick come back to join us just generally to talk about funding opportunities. And I do want to also highlight the fact that we have a list which we're going to share with everybody afterwards of some of the different foundations and organizations that we identified in terms of getting ready for the session this afternoon, which you're very welcome to share to everybody. Um, but I just wanted to just, be, just before we move on to that, I just wanted to ask Roslyn, when you're looking for partnering organizations locally, are there any features that you can you can share with everybody and say we look for them to be at least you know that they have to be around for at least five years or three years or do you have any kind of criteria that you use in terms of selecting organizations that you work with locally I mean obviously having a track record helps <laughs> so you know if you say but we don't have a minimum how long you have to have existed for yeah and it's much more um yeah proven success and proven able ability to 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 have the organizational capacity to do it, not just the expertise, but the expertise is needed and the local network is needed. And But the most important thing for us over the last few years, and this sounds, is, is actually the shared values. Now we work in an international context, so it's just not just Europe, but this um, this kind of having having the common um, goals and the shared and the common agenda and the shared values is very important to us. Um, and so it is uh, human rights based media and information literacy and it is uh, <laughs> and this is really important um, yeah. for us that we're looking at um, you know democratic practice yeah. and we're looking at uh -huh. and so for us this is um, key and um, and as I was saying just before um, it, you know, when you work with us, you also have to have to understand you don't have the autonomy. You're suddenly working with us. It's a, it's a partnership on both sides. It's not just a transactional um, money uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think organizations also, I mean, this is why it takes a lot of discussion and getting to know each other to work out if this actually is what's wanted from both sides. And so it's... it's um, it's more complicated or complex uh, than than uh, than having um, basic requirements or minimum yeah. requirements. Yeah, and it's a case of making that explicit as well too, from the word go. Even though it's sort of understood, but you know, the organisation, the local partner, needs to make that very clear that that's what they're about. Yeah, because it's very different to a normal funding relationship where you take the money, you deliver, you send in your reports and your invoices, and yeah. everyone's happy. Okay, look, uh, then I think in terms of, of kind of moving us on to a more open conversation, if we can, not that this hasn't been an open conversation. Thanks, Iglika, I see your comment as well, too, about the fact that you're being funded with the small grants program, the US Embassy in Sofia, and also referring to this partnership model as being the way that it should be. Um, we have some time. Uh, thanks, Chloe has just uh, given the list of funding. Um, you can download the PDF from the chat, this list of funders, possible funders that we saw. But Maybe we just like to open this up a little bit. Please feel free to put any comments into the chat and we'll happily switch on your microphone as well too. Or have you have you put your question or your point of view? Um, maybe we could start with you, Juliana. Did you have any specific points you wanted to raise now with Nick and with Rosalyn after that discussion that we've had thus far? I do actually, I've got a couple of questions um, that might be also um, worthwhile putting to, in fact, for both um, Nick and Rosalyn. Um, One of them is about getting away from a zero sum game. So leading on from that question about if a grant comes along and you don't have the capacity to take it, um, in an ideal world, you would realize we're all in it together and we are all fighting whatever it is, you know, whatever you want to call the the threats to uh, um, that make the need for media literacy so pressing, polarization, um, propaganda disinformation, whatever you want to call it, or just general need for media literacy in a in a more digital environment. Um, in an ideal world, you would be glad to pass that grant on to the next organization that does have that kind of capacity, because we're all trying to save the world. Um, and if we can't take that money that will save that will help save the world, then somebody else should be taking that money. How do you 
negotiate that within your community, Nick, um, when you're saying, you know, it is a competitive space, um, but you are actually pulling, you're trying to pull in the same direction. I'm sure you're working in lots of alliances with other organizations. How do you live and really exercise the principle of a shared goal, a non-zero-sum game when it comes to grants? Or is that an unrealizable ideal? Um, I mean, based on personal experience, actually, we haven't necessarily been put in that exact situation where we've had a capacity issue per se, because there's a, we have, we have a big enough office that there's always capacity to do something. It's just a matter of, you know, the scale of it. Uh, what we have found ourselves in a situation is, you know, it's just not a right fit for the type of organization and, and the activities that we carry out where we've passed it on. Uh, because again, we, we recognize that, you know, uh, shared goals uh, and particularly ones that come with uh, attached resources and um, are, are, are always uh, beneficial collectively. Um, and so actually where we have found that we've passed things on have been mostly around the type of grants and the activities involved. Uh, we're an advocacy-based organization, for instance. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're very active, we're dynamic. I mean, we're, we're NGO lobbyists. I, I know some, some sometimes lobbying is, 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 a, is a dirty word here in Brussels, um, but we are of the opinion actually that, that lobbying is a health part of the democratic policy making process as long as it's done ethically and transparently. Um, and so, uh, for instance, we have recognized that there have been interesting opportunities on the policy areas that we work on that align with our strategic vision, uh, that comes with uh, promised resources, uh, that align with, you know, a whole bunch of different factors as far as opportunities go, but they involve intense research. We're not researchers, for instance, and so but we know organizations that, you know, are research based, whether it's our chapters or not. I mean, you know, so it's it's really how we we've, we've looked at it through the lens of, you know, are we can we bring the skills and, and the experience that's needed in this particular call? Or is there some other organization, whether it's in TI or not, that could be better at it? And in, that, in those cases, we have passed on opportunities where we just have determined that, you know, we're not the best fit for this. And actually, there's an organization that that can bring that skill set much more to the table to deliver, hopefully, more impact than we would. Um, and But we've also luckily been the recipient going the other way, where there's some organizations that have said, well, actually, you know, we don't really engage in that kind of direct advocacy advocacy at an EU level, but but Transparency International EU does do that. And so maybe you should talk to them. And so uh, mm -hmm. luckily we're in a we're in sort of an altruistic space here in the civil society community where, where that actually does happen quite a bit. Uh, but it hasn't really revolved around the issue of capacity per se, at least in my experience. It has has more to do about the skill sets that one can bring to the table to deliver the the impact that we're all looking to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's really um, important to bear in mind. And maybe uh, some of you have got examples of when that happened um, to you as well, how you have shared uh, resources and funding opportunities with other organizations that might not be doing the same exact thing, but something that is related. Um, and also, I wonder whether any of you have come up with this. So we can see an awful lot of people in the media literacy space offering money for the kind of work we do. We're nonprofit and we don't take any money for anything that we do. We don't take money for the classrooms that we visit or we don't take money for the uh, teacher training that we do or the, or the research that we do or anything like that. But I do think in the media literacy space, there is a space for for profit or at least for charging or perhaps for combining an organization that does non-profit on one side and for profit on the other side and in a way perhaps um, that is a way of creating more sustainable media literacy work to fund your non-profit work with the income from your for-profit work and I am wondering and maybe maybe Rosalind you can I can see you nodding and maybe maybe you can say something about this I wonder if that's is that something that is actually doable well how do funders view this I have no idea if it's doable. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm guessing there's lots of tax sides to it and everything else that makes it complicated if you're not for profit and your how you're registered in your country and these things that um, impact on that. I mean, I think that if you are, I mean, your registration changes, doesn't it? Um, 
or you'd have to be registered as both. I don't. I I don't actually know the the legal side to it. Sally knows. Well, it's just, to, <laughs> just to say that I mean we're a membership organisation, right? And we charge for both for membership, and we also charge for some of the activities that we run, conferences. Some of our webinars, for example, are free for our members, but are not a free. There, there's a booking fee for others. So, but we're still not for profit. We are registered as an I visit way here in Belgium. And you're perfectly mm. allowed to do that. Of course, you are. The principle of the organisation is there's no profit taken out. There are no shareholders. There's a board of management, and the ownership lies with the members as represented by the membership board. But we're perfectly entitled to carry out commercial activities and we use our commercial activities to help to fund the organization and i think that's probably true of many of the organizations and that we see even joining a session like this here this afternoon i don't see any problem with that um, i think once again we talk about transparency no better than nick to talk about that but we do talk about the fact we it's very clear we have to produce our public records every year we're looked at by an auditor so it isn't a problem we have a vat number that's not a problem you know so i think you can set yourself up but it comes back to how you structure yourself as an organization mm -hmm. at the beginning and where you how you think you're going to manage yourself going forward mm -hmm. to my mind so sorry i'm both asking a question and answering it there for you juliana but uh, it is i think it is perfectly possible i don't know whether yeah. others have opinions about that or not no, we do. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, you know, this is not something that we are currently actively thinking of putting in place. But when we think about, you know, we're, you know, probably everybody on this call is in the civil society sector or not and or nonprofit to some extent, um, and certain in public uh, in the public space. But, you know, there is maybe we don't need to insist on being non-profit maybe you know there you know in you know lit, re, basic literacy like reading and writing can be for profit publishers make money with uh you know they are for profit when they write textbooks etc it's just a thought yeah. that i think for making um sustainable um yeah. media think, literacy models I think, I think we're looking i think that non-profit and not for profit i think mm. i think the, i think the trick is in the wording there we're not mm. for profit but doesn't mean we're not taking a profit off some of our activities Non-profit to me is a little different, so I think it comes right down to the terminology. Yeah, Nick, I don't know whether you agree with me or not on that, or how you feel about that. I, I do. I, I think for for us, it actually, Rosalind, I think perhaps articulated our position. It it comes down actually to to your legal status in the member state. I mean that's that's what it, that's what determines what we do and what we don't do with our status and it and it and it differs in 27 different jurisdictions um we're we're a particular legal entity in Bel Belgium uh that prevents us from doing some things prevents us from making certain uh mm -hmm. profits over a percentage of our annual budget uh we tend not to we have made also a determination that sometimes also, yeah, VAT status is, is, is sometimes problematic uh, and, and you have to do a cost benefit analysis of whether you want to retain that and, and, and all, all the potential uh, organizational burdens that comes with it based on what you're bringing into the organization from fee making activities. And actually we don't really do that anymore. Uh, we used to dabble with it, but it just didn't, it didn't, didn't generate uh, the 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 amount that we would need to justify, yeah, sort of the tax related issues at play with that, um, uh, and only be, and also because we don't because of our organization we didn't really also have the opportunities for any kind of you know fee paying for instance, um, I mean we would give speeches sometimes uh, where we would we would charge only if the organizer was charging. The participants so we give speeches all over the place um to, to different organizations and associations and groups uh for free um you know but if if that that organization was charging participants obviously i think it would it, it only is fair that that there would be some sort of a company fee for the speakers so since you know we are helping generate that profit for the organization but it, it rarely came comes up for for us i think it's just a different model mm -hmm. yeah um, may I ask Sally a question? And that is with your vast um, and long um, experience of the media literacy space um, and your view of you know how the funding space for this area has changed over the years, um, can you characterize the change that you've seen? And then with that knowledge, can you give a little bit of a, maybe even a prediction of where you think it's going next? <laughs> First, first of all, you you age me 
<laughs> but I'll, oh. probably, I'll probably have to live with that, but not to worry. Um, no, I, I think I think it's it's a little bit as you said yourself at the beginning. I think we've gone from this being. I mean, Rosalind and I know along each other a long time, and you know, media literacy was a minority sport. There's no doubt about it. It was something that people were not particularly concerned about. It was over there in the corner, and there was a lot of discussions about definitions um, and trying to figure out actually what we were talking about. Whereas now, I mean, because of the the whole issue around disinformation, because of the way that our our, our whole view of democracy is changing, of course media literacy is brought into that and for me that's a very good thing you know and I, I certainly don't don't regret it by any manner or means but it does um it does in a way challenge us because we're also asked very quick to come up very quickly now with quick results um quick answers um show me the impact of what you're doing and of course what we're doing and much of the work that is carried out by our members and by others in the area of media literacy is not measurable in the short term by any manner or means and so i think we have to be a little bit careful insofar as that we're a flavor of the month at the moment and you know we're getting a lot of attention but there is a danger of course that if we're not careful that we will be you know we will be seen as as promising a lot and not actually delivering so we have to be careful to determine our own on our own terms what it is and our members and the people we work with mm. i think are very aware of that so we talk a lot about evaluation and impact these days there's a lot of a lot of um attention being paid to that and i think it's important on people not people like me but people who are practitioners in the field really have a say in what we do and what we measure in order that we don't end up being bringing ourselves into trouble in the short term mm. i don't know whether that's very useful or not but uh, i think that's probably going to bring us very close to the end juliana if i'm not mistaken um quick wrap up maybe from everybody here i don't see any further questions thanks for the comments and the feedback that we've been getting in the chat but maybe a quick roundup from everybody from Rosalind, maybe final thoughts if you want to share with everybody the whole point of the session this afternoon was to diversified think about your funding and maybe look at other any opportunities anything you'd like to say i mean i'd like to just add on to the last point of what you said i think that we need this multi-stakeholder approach from like we're very much in kind of structural systemic change that's needed the long-term thing that sally's referencing um but as you now know like right now i'm sitting in paris in a hotel room because i'm at this um unesco uh, you know internet for trust event and there are a chapter on media literacy and what the platforms are going to have to do and how they have to involve media literacy experts in this and practitioners and so this is only growing yeah and it's the same when you look at the code for practice from the eu from last week <laughs> um or from last year there's now a big commitment also media literacy there for the platforms to actually take radical action and change how they develop their products with media literacy experts so there is going to be this space this diversification of funding is going to get more complex because you then have to ask yourself the questions about the platforms and this is something we discussed earlier when we we're preparing for this uh, session are we going to discuss the platforms but that will be the next big challenge that civil society does have to think about and decide on and media literacy has to see what what role media literacy experts will have to decide how they want mm. to support that because the platforms are there they're staying and they need to improve absolutely nick i mean no just as just to stress you know three last points one of which i i already made which is uh, yeah the the recognition and the need to to play the long game when when you're looking for s sustainable and diversified funding and two uh and i know it can be a pain uh but you need to to be committed to dedicating time and resources into fundraising I know particularly that's difficult for small organizations. Uh, if you don't have the skill sets, you need to seek them out. You need to maybe even get training, uh, but it, it, it does take time. I know because I'm doing it all the time um, to, to, to ensure that fundraising uh, is, is granted the requisite amount of time and resources uh, organizationally. And then the third point, I suppose I, I leave, which I sort of touched upon earlier is that you need to adopt a creative approach. Uh, that creativity doesn't just extend to what kind of donors you're looking for or the types of grants, but perhaps what what 
was alluded to with the, the, the bringing together of different stakeholders, whether they be academics or civil society, but a creative approach in finding other partners uh, when, when doing these grants, uh, because I think that that is actually perhaps one of the more important elements that at least some donors are looking at. I mean, you know, if I partner with a bunch of transparency civil society organizations on the call, it might not bring as much um, attention uh, from a donor if I was, uh, you know, thoughtfully bringing in other stakeholders with different skill sets, but all complementary that might be more beneficial in achieving the impact set forth by the call. And so I think with that, and again, thank you very much for the invitation and, and the kind attention from the all participants. Great, thanks. Juliana, you are going to show us a couple of quick slides as well, just to remind people about, thank you so much, Nick, thank you so much, Roslyn, about lie detectors, uh, so people know where to find out more and know more about your organization. I think this is all in one um, in one presentation. So um, we are we are running our training workshops for teachers and students and children in a variety of languages. And you're very welcome if that is something that is of interest to you to contact us if you want to um, be aware of our research. And as Sally was saying, evaluation is important. This is something that we're paying extreme attention to and working with academia and making sure that we don't fall um, become prey to solutionism, I think is a really good and important word to bear in mind. Um, uh, and not trying to find quick fixes that actually don't really fix things. Um, if you want to know about what we're doing on that, then do follow us on, on LinkedIn. Thanks, Juliana. And I think I just have one last slide as well, too, if I may. Media Literacy, this is our newsletter on um, Media Learning Newsletter. It comes out every month. Join us, sign up for it if you haven't seen it. A um, couple of articles are quoted there. And then our next, uh, the next sessions in our Wednesday webinar series, 22nd of March and the 19th of April, are both on the new Edmo Hub starter this year. And then on the 10th of May on video-based resources for schools. And our conference takes place in June in Leuven in Belgium. That's everything from us. I think we went a couple of minutes or one minute over time. Thank you so very much uh, from Juliana and from me and to our colleagues and uh, lie detectors. And here, thank you very much, Chloe, for making the session run so smoothly. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. We'll see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you.